So what I'm going to be talking about today is um, the research that I did for my doctoral program that involved two studies related to capacity building um, for individuals uh, who are deaf and have additional developmental disabilities and the people who provide support to families. And those there is a greater incidence of autism and de other developmental disabilities uh, in children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And um, one particular study, although it's uh, back in 1991, they had a large sample of deaf and hard of hearing children and looked specifically to see how many of those 1,150 kids were also diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder and found that 5.3% also had autism, so that's quite a high percentage when you compare it to hearing children and even when you compare it to today's percentage of hearing children with autism, and this was quite some time ago. Um, and of those 5.3%, 80% of those kids had severe to profound hearing loss. So we're not talking kid, about kids with kind of mild hearing loss that are going to be able to function in terms of using their speech and hearing. We're talking about kids with pretty significant hearing loss. Um, so there have been a bunch of studies that have looked at groups of deaf kids and how many deaf kids have developmental disabilities. There have also been studies that have taken, say, kids with autism and how many kids with autism have hearing loss. And they also find that there's a larger proportion of kids with autism who have hearing loss compared to kids who don't have autism and have hearing loss. So we're seeing increasing numbers of kids with these dual diagnoses and sometimes multiple diagnoses. A little bit of history in terms of deaf kids with developmental disabilities and where they've been schooled. Kind of historically, these kids were in special education programs in typical hearing schools or in segregated schools for kids with developmental disability. And quite rarely were they in schools for the deaf. And over the past several years, schools for the deaf have noticed an increasing number of these students coming to their schools for all kinds of reasons, but one of them being that parents would like their children to be in a school where they have access to the language of instruction, sign language. And oftentimes in hearing schools, the staff have minimal, if any, sign language skills, and so that's been a concern for parents. So as these children with additional disabilities are coming into schools for the deaf, what we're finding is that educators, teachers of the deaf, need more than what their teacher training for the deaf programs have provided them with, which tend to focus specifically on deaf and hard of hearing kids and not these additional disabilities. Parents are also finding that this is a real issue. Parents who have deaf children with additional diagnoses are finding that if they go to schools for the deaf or programs for the deaf, the deaf ed people don't know what to do about the autism or whatever. And in hearing programs or programs for kids with autism and developmental disabilities, they don't know what to do about the deafness. And so they're kind of stuck trying to figure out where is it I'm supposed to go to get the best services for my kid. So then we've got um, certainly deaf education professionals need training to be able to provide direct service to the kid. Parents are also saying that they need some service provision to teach them how to support their own children. And certainly training deaf education professionals to provide that training to parents as well would be really important if we can have a deaf education professional who understands deafness and who understands the additional disabilities and can provide that kind of support to parents. So looking at particularly the behavior issues and how we might kind of address those, moving towards positive behavior support, um, which is an applied science with a real focus on expanding the repertoire of an individual's behaviors, so teaching them new kinds of behaviors, also enhancing environments to make environments kind of work better for individuals with the goal of improving quality of life as well as minimizing problem behavior. But it's not just about getting rid of problem behavior, it's really about making good lives for individuals and their families and those who live and work with them. It involves a team-based process that's collaborative and there must be a functional assessment of behavior in order to develop interventions. So we need to understand why the behavior is happening from the individual's perspective, what purpose it serves for them. The other part about uh, positive behavior support that's really important to consider in light of this area and the needs um, in deaf education has to do with empowering key stakeholders. And that's a major part of positive behavior support. It's not that the professionals come in, solve it, and leave. The professionals come in and really support and empower whether it's teachers, parents, grandparents, the babysitter, whoever it is, to be able to continue to provide that kind of support and to use strategies to support that individual in all kinds of additional environments to be able to generalize strategy use. And then so when we look more specifically at family-centered positive behavior support, this is where we would be looking at a behavior consultant um, who has expertise in functional assessment of problem behavior, who knows how to develop 
positive behavior support plans, um, working collaboratively with parents who obviously have expertise about their child and about their family life, their family values, how their home works, how they want to raise their child. And when those two individuals can come together and work collaboratively, that's when we can see improvements, um, again, not only in child behavior, but often we get quite good reports of you know, family quality of life being improved. Parents come back and say, you know, it really has changed Considering our lives. Considering all of those things and the needs of the community, I looked first to um, do a study around training. Training for deaf education professionals who work in various capacities with deaf children and youth teaching them to do functional assessments and develop positive behavior support plans. So that was um, the focus of the first study. And really looking at is a training program, a train the trainer model of PBS training associated with improved knowledge of the staff in terms of functional assessment and positive behavior support plan development. So for this study, there were 11 professionals that participated. Uh, nine of them were deaf and used ASL as their primary language of communication. One was hard of hearing, and she used both spoken English and ASL. In terms of where they worked, we had some sign language specialists who taught ASL to families. We had people who worked in home and community settings supporting children and their families. Uh, there was a child care counselor who worked in the dorm at the BC School for the Deaf, supporting children there. Um, a coordinator who worked with families across BC, helping to coordinate services. An educational assistant from a school program. Um, three individuals who were working in group homes, supporting youth to transition into adulthood and a program coordinator who managed a number of staff in her program and kind of oversaw program development and service provision to families and children. So the dependent variables for this study were changes in staff knowledge regarding behavioral principles, functional assessment techniques, and PBS plan development, and also the social validity of that training program in terms of uh, the importance and the acceptability of the goals, the procedures, and the outcomes of that training experience for them. The independent variable, what we did, was implemented a train-the-trainer program of PBS training. It was lecture delivered. I delivered it. Um, it involved both group, group activities and case study work in addition to the lecture. It was delivered in ASL. We decided pretty early on, given that everybody signed and the majority of people were deaf, it kind of made more sense for me to, to just deliver it directly as opposed uh, to going through an interpreter. Four-hour sessions, twice a week, five weeks over summer holidays. Um, so. In terms of the content, we did focus on basic principles of behavior, the functions of behavior, to gain attention, to escape, right, the, the basic functions. They learned both indirect, so assessment-based or interview-based assessment techniques, and direct or observational assessment techniques. And then they learned how to develop PBS plans focusing on strategies to address setting events, the kind of distant predictors, right, the things that set you, set an individual up to perhaps engage in problem behavior, um, the antecedent interventions, things that we do to address triggers, the kinds of instructional strategies, how to decide what we teach children, and then consequences both to increase desired behavior and decrease the problematic behavior. And this study used a one-group pretest post-test design, and changes in staff knowledge were measured using that pretest post-test. It was a 45-item, multiple-choice, written English test um, that was administered at the very beginning of the first session and at the very end of the final session. And social validity was assessed using an eight-item questionnaire, Likert scale, that was administered at the end of the final session as well. So in terms of the results regarding staff knowledge, um, a paired two sample for means t-test was used to compare the results, and there was a statistically significant difference between the pretest scores, mean of 23.73, and the post-test scores, mean of 34.65, at the P001 level. If we just look at the average scores pre and post. Um, so here's the pretest average score out of 45, um, almost 24, 23.73, with a range of 13 to 28. The post test average was 34.65, with a range of 23 to 42. All but one of the individuals improved their score from pre to post. One individual had exactly the same score um, pre to post. In terms of social validity, uh, rating was high, 4.7 average across all of the participants. And they talked about the program being relevant to their needs. They all had experience in their various work settings of coming across children or youth who engaged in pretty significant problem behavior and they didn't know what to do about it and they felt afterwards that they had some idea um, of things that they could do to address that. 
they found the instructional strategies clear and effective, and one of the things that they talked about during the social validity assessment and have also mentioned long after the program, in fact, just a couple of months ago, was how nice it was to be able to get that instruction directly from an individual as opposed to going through an interpreter. They recognized that even the best of interpreters, there's a change in the language, um, and that it was really nice to be able to access, access the, the material and question the individual directly, that we could have that back and forth. So that was something that they really liked. And then the next thing that I wanted to do, of course, was see, now, could someone who completed this training program actually go and work with a family and uh, affect some change? So the participants for the second study were Kieran, who at the time was an eight-year-old boy who is deaf, diagnosed as well with autism and cerebral palsy, so multiple diagnoses. Um, he had problem behaviors were non-compliance, just generally ignoring. He was a great ignorer. Um, physical interference, pushing mom away, negative vocalizations, and pretty severe food refusal. It also involved his family, his mom, Lisa, who was a homemaker and served as the primary interventionist because she was the one at home all the time. Uh, his dad, Colin, worked in computer sales and services, and because he worked shift work, wasn't always home for the intervention. And then it involved Alicia, who was one of the trainees from the first study. She got a score of 91% on her post-test. She herself is deaf uses ASL for communication. She has two undergrad degrees, both a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Education. Yes. So the PBS intervention happened in the family home, and it happened around these three target routines that were decided in collaboration with the parents. So these were three priorities for them. Um, first of all, Kieran going to the bath on, him, on his own. Um, at this point, he's eight. He's getting heavier. He crawls around the house. And he would refuse to go anywhere, pretty much, but definitely the bath when he was asked to go. And mom was getting to the point where she couldn't carry him anymore. The next routine was a transition from the computer. So any time that she asked him to turn off the computer, there were all kinds of upsets. Uh, and then finally, dinner being really the biggest priority for this family and getting Kieran to eat more foods than grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, Super supervision meetings between myself and Alicia happened at her place of work, so um, at the Provincial Services for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Dependent variables for this study, we looked at percentage of intervals of problem behavior that Kieran engaged in, as well as the percentage of routine steps completed. We also assessed social validity from the parents' perspective, so again, the importance and acceptability of this process of having um, Alicia come into the home and do an assessment and implement and support them in implementing uh, whether or not this really worked for them. And also the goodness of fit between the positive behavior support plans that Alicia developed and how well that really fit with their family lifestyle, their values, kind of how they worked at home. Um, and also if it kind of met with the resources that they had. In terms of the independent variable, it was a family-centered PBS process that involved a whole bunch of things absolutely a collaborative partnership. So Alicia and the mom in particular worked quite closely together to develop plans, um, to refine plans, and to implement those plans. It also involved multi-component PBS plans that were designed to address every feature of the problem. We also focused on contextual fit. So Alicia really needed to work to make sure that the plan she developed fit with family life. And then it also involved individualized support in terms of implementation. In terms of data collection, we used videotaped observations, collect the data. It was then downloaded to the computer, and we used paper and pencil coding. Um, the parents would complete a 20-item questionnaire that used a five-point Likert scale to assess contextual fit of every single support plan. So every time that we were about to begin a plan before implementation, they completed this questionnaire. They did it again after implementation. And then we had them do it one more time at the end of the study, keeping all three of the routines in mind when they, fill, when they answered those questions. And then we also used an eight item questionnaire to assess social validity. So again, um, the parents would fill this out at the end of each routine. And then again, at the end of the study, keeping in mind all three of the routines. So this study utilized a single subject, multiple baseline design, with replication across those three activity settings with a multiple probe measurement strategy. And we'll get to the exciting part, the data. Um, so here we've got the first routine, bath transition, and we're going to be looking at percentage of intervals of problem behavior across the probe sessions. So we've got bath transition at the top, followed by computer transition, and then finally the dinner routine. And if we look 
at the point of change from baseline to initial training, what you see is there's a pretty dramatic drop in problem behavior at that phase change point across all three of those. So, you know, from about 70% to about 10, again, about 80% to about 10, and here about 80% to zero um, for that first data point. And you'll notice that by and large, things maintain pretty nicely, the occasional um, blip. Occasionally we had some reactivity, that's what this data point right there was all about. Um, he started being reactive to my presence in the house, so we hid the video camera up on a shelf and I just didn't uh, show my face. I would come before he got home from school, set up the camera, go away, and as soon as we did that, the problem behavior bounced back up to where it had been before. We look at averages of um, percentage of intervals of problem behavior across all of the routines at baseline. He was engaging in 61% percent of the time he was engaging in problem behavior, so pretty high, high percentage. That dropped to 4% during that initial training phase, and then it dropped further to 3% during the maintenance phase, so some pretty dramatic change in terms of uh, his use of problem behavior during those three times. And then when we look again at uh, a graph percentage of steps completed along the probe session for the bath, the computer, and the dinner routines, we see again um, very, very low, often zero, uh, percentage of steps completed, there's that reactivity here. Um, for dinner time, he always got a little bit because he would do the first two steps. He'd come to the table and he'd pray. Once the food was out, there, <laughs> there, there was no doing. So he always got two steps at least. Um, and, you know, occasionally if there was something that he did like on the plate, he'd have a bite of that. And then as soon as the request to eat the, the rest of the meal, uh, he stopped. So we never got very much in terms of uh, him completing any steps there. But again, as soon as we implemented intervention, we come up quite high. This turned out to be uh, a day that he was sick, so he didn't do quite so much, but again, popped right back up. Um, again, in the computer transition routine, 80 up to 100, and then he stayed at 100. Um, from dinner, he went up to almost 100% on that first day and then moved up to 100. And again, we had kind of a bad day here. Mum needed a little bit of a booster session. We had to go in and kind of talk about some of the strategies she was using. And one of the things we needed to address for him was independent eating. And that was a goal, was for him to be able to feed himself. Uh, but what we found is that it's a really lengthy process for him. He does have some shaky motor movements. It takes him quite a long time to keep the food balanced and get it to his mouth. So it was exhausting. Uh, and so part of him not completing all of those steps had to do with he kind of just got tired of feeding himself. We went in and kind of decided that he would feed himself a little bit and his parents would also kind of feed as and well. And again, looking at average uh, steps completed across all three of those routines. During the baseline phase, he was completing about 20%. That jumped to 88% during initial training and an average of 94% of steps completed during the maintenance phase. So the parents were pretty happy. I think most parents are pretty happy, even if their typical kids do, 94% of what it is that um, we would like children to do. So what I thought we would do is actually take a look at each of those three routines. Video is the best part of all, always. And spend some time looking at kind of what he looked like beforehand, what the assessment information showed, the kind of plans that Alicia developed, and then you'll see what implementation looked like and kind of uh, the change for him. So you see, he is a great ignorer. the great trick of all deaf children. If my eyes are covered, you can't tell me what to do. Later, 
more books. <laughs> now, last time. Come on. So this whole process spanned about five minutes. Right, so that's kind of what it looked like. Now, certainly she could have made him go. If she kind of picked him up and hauled him off, he wouldn't have been happy. But her goal was that she could say, go, and he'd go. Because, you know, she's envisioning he's 10, he's 12, he's 14. She can't be carrying him around. Um, it's already weighing on her physically, um, where, you know, her back is starting to hurt and, and those problems are cropping up for her. And you see that, you know, if she's just talking to him, he pretty much pretends not to see her, or he tries to engage her in a conversation like, oh, look, here on the book, let's talk about this. So he'd do all of these kinds of things basically to distract her from what she wanted him to be doing, and he right, was quite skilled at that. So when we looked kind of at the problem and what some of the issues were for him, looking first at the setting events, kind of the things that set him up to not follow through with what mom was asking him, for him, there was a lot of um, issue around predictability. He often didn't really know very clearly what the expectations were, um, when he got what he wanted, you know, what would happen if he didn't. He didn't know any of that. Um, he also had really very little choice across his day. His day is pretty packed, um, and it's pretty much all day he's being told what to do. So there's very little opportunity for choice. And one of the things we noticed is that any time there was any leeway that he could kind of assert, no, I'm not going to, he certainly would. And, and part of that was, you know, he never got to assert anything around what he did during the day. Um, he also was quite tired. This was a kid who had interrupted sleep patterns, but also a very long school day. I believe he would get on the school bus around 7 o'clock in the morning. He lives quite far from the school to get to the school that starts at 9. And then he would be the last kid dropped off at the bus, sometimes 4.30 to 5 o'clock. So he could be gone 10 hours in a day. So he's not slept well, and he's got this horrendously long day. So that doesn't set him up to be very cooperative either. Um, certainly physical fatigue. He had to expend quite a bit of physical energy just moving about through the day. And the poor nutrition, which probably fed into some of that fatigue and being tired as well. So those things all kind of rolled in for him. The trigger for his problem behavior was simply mom asking him to go, and he would engage in all of those kinds of problem behaviors that you saw. Sometimes it was pretty mild ignoring. Sometimes he'd start yelling or saying no or push her hand away um, and do those kinds of things. And in terms of function, essentially there were kind of two functions. One was to escape having to go to the bath and doing that transition, but there was also that tangible piece in that he would always get to continue doing whatever activity it was he was currently doing, which was often a preferred activity to going to the bath. So, you know, not only did he escape having to go, he got more of what he liked. So in terms of, you know, thinking about what could happen, looking at an alternative replacement behavior, what could he do instead of the problem that would still serve the same function, get him the same thing? He could ask for five more minutes. And, you know, mom said, sure, if he were to say five minutes, I'd wait for five minutes and then off we'd go. But really, you know, the big dream for her was that she would come and say, hey, go to the bath, and he'd say, of course, mother, and off, you know, he would go. And if he did so, she'd, you know, lavish him with praise, and he'd get some sort of tangible after the bath he could have a preferred toy or engage in a preferred activity. So that was kind of the structure of, you know, where we were thinking in terms of his plan. In terms of actual strategies, I'm not going to go through all of them, and the strategies aren't in your handouts because they'd have been this big, but if you actually want to see these, feel free to email me and I'm happy to give them to you. We provided him with a visual schedule to increase predictability. And within the visual schedule, we provided him with some visually mediated positive contingency statements. If you do this, this will happen. And if you do that, that will happen to help him understand and make those predictions. Um, we made sure that he had a snack before bath. Bath always happened after dinner, and he usually didn't eat a very good dinner. So we wanted to make sure that he wasn't hungry either. So mom would just provide a snack. Um, 
we had down that we would provide a pre-correction to request five more minutes and that we would teach him to make that request, but only if necessary. We kind of had the inkling that when we put out the visual and showed him what the expectation was, he would go with it. So we kind of decided we're going to see what he does with that, and if he goes with it, we're just going to go with it because that's really what mom wants to happen anyway. Um, and certainly we needed to teach him, you know, if... If he was going to ask, we'd have to teach him to do that. We also had a timer for him, and we needed to teach him how to re refer to the visual timer and know that the timer's now flashing, it means you have to go. And then in terms of consequences, he'd be praised and he'd get a preferred activity if he did what he was supposed to do. Mum would ignore and redirect the little minor things and essentially remind him of the contingencies. And if he really engaged in the problem behaviors, she essentially would not let up. What you saw in the baseline video is that she'd kind of ask him, and he'd ignore her, and then she'd kind of sit back and wait for at least a few seconds before re-delivering that request. And so every time, he'd kind of win, right? I get a few more minutes of what I'm doing while you're sitting there kind of waiting to ask me again. And so in terms of her consequent strategies to minimize that behavior, she would just stay on him. So you can ignore me, but I'm just going to keep delivering the request. I'm not going to step back. Uh, what ended up happening, we never had to implement that consequence strategy because, really and truly, when we put this in front of him, he kind of said, oh, sure, of course, I'd love to. And that pretty much was it. So this was the contingency map that Alicia developed uh, for him. The antecedent trigger, mom says go to bath. And then here's the path we'd like him to take, and we put it in green because green means go. Um, go to bath fast, and we were really focusing on the fast aspect for him because he was a dawdler anyway. Um, so you need to go fast, and then you get bath toys. And we actually had a little piece of Velcro up here and several choices of bath toys that were fun and exciting that he didn't get at any other time, um, and he would choose. So again, giving him some opportunities to make choice. He'd have his bath, and then um, he got to dress his bear. Fortuitously, just before this routine intervention started, he got to build a bear. And it turned out he thought it was the greatest thing in the entire world, and he loved to do nothing more than dress this bear. So we got him some extra clothes for the bear, and that was the reinforcer, and he, like, that was the best thing. Um, this path shows what happens if he does not go fast. If he doesn't go fast, there are no bath toys. He still has to have a bath. So whether it takes him you know, five, you know, a half an hour to get there, uh, he's still having it. He also won't get to dress his bear if he doesn't do that. And we really did kind of put this down in front of him. Alicia modeled it the first night for mom. And, of course, having the interventionist do it, kids often will be a bit more uh, compliant with somebody who's not their parent because it's not their parent. And then mom took over the next night, and that was kind of it. So this is what it looked like after we'd implemented intervention. He's signing dictionary. Not time for dictionary. Yeah. It's time for math. Okay? Remember? Yeah. 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 Pick a toy. Yeah, so he points out the path that he's supposed to go on yeah. and the bear. Now, he has a sense of humor. She said, do you want to pick one? And he says four. Four? No. Yeah, so then he drops it to two. How about two? 
Silly. And he signs one. One, yes. Decisions, decisions. So he'd go to his bedroom because he needs help changing. She'd change him and put on a robe, and then he comes out in his little robe. And now the toys are up on the bathroom counter, and he's going to make sure she's going to hold to the deal. So he points to them, and he signs toys. Yes, toys, yes. And pretty much get it. <laughs> Show me that I'm going to get this toy. Uh, come on. Remember, you need to be fast. Uh, All right, so quite a difference um, and way easier for mom. So then we moved on to the computer routine once we had that bath thing uh, sorted out. And you'll see the computer routine, he's even less happy about start stopping that than he was about going to the bath. Right. And on and on it would go. If she took the computer away, there'd be an hour of screaming. Right? He'd camp if she hid it in their bedroom, he'd camp outside the bedroom door screaming for it. Right? So that's kind of where that would go. Um, many similar features for this routine as with the bath transition. Again, predictability and choice were issues and certainly being tired. This was usually um, the first thing that he did when he got home from school. So he wasn't really in a happy frame of mind anyway. He was pretty tired. Um, and when he was asked to shut down the computer again, he'd engage in many of the same kinds of behaviors, um, but often with a lot more yelling. Again, to escape having to turn that computer off and also to get more time on the computer. So um, like with the bath routine, mom was fine. You know, if he asks for five more minutes, that's cool. But really, she'd like him to shut down the programs, not just close the case. And that was one of the skills that she wanted him to learn how to do that we talked about. You know, it's kind of important that he knows how to go through the process of closing your programs and actually shutting down the computer, not just closing it and firing it off somewhere. So that was one of the goals was that he was able to do all of the shutting down and turning off the computer. And when he did so, he'd uh, get praise. And also he could choose the activity after the computer. It wasn't so much that mom had, you know, homework or like work stuff he had to do. She would just like to have him spend a little less time on the computer because he was a kid that would spend pretty much every waking moment at home in front of a screen and she liked to see him doing other kinds of things. So again his plan, quite similar strategies. It made it really nice um, for mom in terms of implementing this routine because much of what she learned in the bath routine she 
applied in this routine. So it really was nice in terms of building up her skill and her confidence in using the strategies. So again, we had a visual schedule and the schedule embedded within it a contingency map so that he knew what those contingencies were. We used a visual timer that flashed red, yellow, green lights so that he knew when it was uh, go and stop. Um, again, we would only do the teach him to ask for five more minutes if that seemed to be indicated, but if he kind of went with the plan, we were going to go with the plan. Um, and just like before, praise and preferred activity, if he did what he was asked, she'd ignore and remind him of the contingencies for minor stuff, and then she pretty much just wouldn't let up if he engaged in problem behavior. She would continue to keep at him and prompt him through that. This was his contingency map for computer, um, and what it shows, essentially we took that five-minute piece and just put it up front. Mom set the timer for five minutes, so he was kind of getting that five-minute warning. Um, she'd turn on the timer and make sure that he was aware it was on. Um, he would then get to play for five more minutes, and then when the time was up, he had to turn off the computer, and again, that key word for him being fast. Um, we showed the steps, because he, this is what he was learning to do, and we actually made a copy of this that Mom would then Velcro to the side of his laptop screen so that she could use it to sort of prompt him through the steps, and then he could choose an activity. If he didn't, Mom would simply take the computer away. End of story, and Mom would choose the activity. So not only do you lose the computer, but Mom's going to tell you what to do next, and you don't get to pick. So here's what intervention looked like. And what you'll notice when they start to do the shutdown, it takes some time because she's trying to teach him and also because of the motor impairments, but he's way more cooperative. So that's the, she, he's got about a minute once it hits yellow. And he signed soon finished. And that's what the yellow light means, is that soon it will be finished. Now it's red. And she velcros that little task analysis onto the side of the computer. So he always had millions of windows open, so lots of X's to hit. This was a touchscreen computer that he had from SetBC. He's caught in the cord. And those were the kinds of interactions we started to see a lot more of. Um, one of the things that Alicia really focused on with mom was how to deliver praise in ASL and how to deliver praise in ASL with a facial expression that matched. 
And for many hearing parents who are learning how to sign, one of the difficult things is making your face match what's coming off your hand. And if you're really concentrating on trying to remember signs, your face sometimes looks a little firm, although your hands are saying good. And the message to the kid is, is it good, is it bad? I don't know, because your hands are saying one thing, but your face is saying something else. And so Alicia spent time with mom just practicing how to deliver signs and getting more comfortable with them. And you see the results in terms of her ability to deliver that praise and his sort of responsivity to it. Um, and, you know, we started to see really this kind of positive exchange thing happening uh, between them and him paying more attention to mom and actually watching her signing more than he had before. So those were some of the nice things that we saw there. And then finally, we came to the big one, uh, the dinner routine. And like I said, uh, this kid didn't eat. So here's mom trying to make him eat the family meal. He's signing not, not, not. Right? Um, that's what it looked like. They very rarely, I mean, the only reason she did this is because I asked her to. Um, they'd gotten to the point where it, there was no purpose in doing this. She couldn't get him to eat. He needs to eat. She's just going to make him what he's going to eat because he's got to eat something. Um, and usually as I was leaving on days that I collected baseline for dinner, literally as I was going out the door, they were making him a grilled, grilled cheese sandwich, right? Like that. And that's the way it, it worked for him. Um, Problem behavior got him out of eating the food he didn't like, and he would get the food that he did like, and it was really to the point that they just never asked him to eat the unpreferred food because that's what happened. But a, real, uh, a lack of experience eating, and particularly using utensils and kind of managing all of that on his own, and he had a long history of food refusal. This had been since he was, you know, a preschooler. So this is what... Uh, his plan essentially looked like, again, lots of visual supports to let him know what the expectations were. We got some adapted utensils for him. So we got an adapted scoop plate that was easy for him to get food up off of that suctioned to the table. Because what you also noticed is that his movements are quite jerky and he could easily kind of knock the plate off. Um, and then we got him utensils that had quite wide handles and were curved. So it was easy. He could just do this motion instead of having to try and turn utensils into his mouth. Um, and we also got him a trip trap chair. It's quite stable. It brought him up higher. Um, his, his, it comes with a bit of a strap. And then his dad made sort of additional straps on it. They made straps for his feet because his legs moved quite a bit. So he got very stable at the dinner table, which was a really important thing for him to then be able to do the kind of motor movements around getting food to his mouth. Um, for this routine, we did not start intervention directly at the dinner table. We started first by implementing an intervention, an interventionist-based intervention, um, away from the dinner table, uh, not with his parents there initially, where we selected, um, again in collaboration with the parents, about 12, we had 12 target foods that sampled the kinds of meats, the kinds of vegetables, and the kinds of casseroles. So we tried to sort of sample different tastes, different textures of food, so that we kind of would hit the kinds of things that the family ate. And we would start with pea-sized, you know, barely a taste on your tongue bites of food, and gradually increasing that size up to normal bites. Um, and initially, you only had to have one bite before you got a cheesy or, you know, whatever kind of reinforcer you liked. And then later on, you know, he had to have several bites before he got that kind of reinforcement. So, so we used that um, as well. We needed to teach him a whole bunch of things. We needed to teach him to be able to use utensils, for sure. Um, asking for help if he needed it, that was a really important thing. If he was getting tired, to then say, hey, could you help me you know, eat this food? Um, teaching him to engage in the conversation at the table. And the other thing that um, his family wanted him to be able to do is you know, somehow politely excuse himself at the end, whether he said, excuse me, or thank you, or I'm done, but to somehow indicate that you know, he, he was done and may I leave the table. If he did what he was supposed to do, he'd be praised. He'd get preferred food and or tangible items, toys, activities. 
Um, they would ignore and redirect the minor problem behaviors. Um, for any major food refusal, we did use escape extinction, and primarily we only had to do this during that interventionist session. So that lasted over a course of about two and a half weeks. And what that involved, using a plastic utensil so there was uh, no potential for harm, the food would be on the spoon, we'd hold it up, ask him to eat it, he would scream, holler, turn his face away, try not to eat it, and we would essentially hold the spoon and wait. So we would never remove the spoon. It would stay there, it would stay there, it would stay there. He'd come to the conclusion that regardless of what he did, the spoon wasn't going away, and I guess I have to eat it. Um, and it took about two or three times of holding the spoon there, and it was over. And after that, he would eat, you know, whatever. This was what his visual looked like at the dinner table. So it was in a plastic stand that sat in front of his plate, and it showed the schedule, so what would happen. Um, you know, they prayed, they would eat, a reminder that eating meant fork and spoon. He would drink milk, which actually ended up being something that mom added to her goals in the midst of our little interventionist sessions. Mom was watching him eat all this food, and she said, well, gee, could you get him to drink some milk? He, he's never, he, he hasn't had milk since he was a baby. And we said, sure, why not give us a cup of milk? And the next thing you know, he's literally, you know, like Friday night at the bar, downing these huge glasses of milk, right? Um, wiping his face afterwards, saying thank you. Um, and then it also had remembering that he would get the food with a fork, he would take a bite, and that then he needed to put his fork down. And again, that's because of the motor movements, and we were kind of concerned that someone would get hurt. Um, by a fork flying around. So teaching him that after you take a bite, return your fork because that's kind of a safe thing to do. Um, and then he would get to choose snack item, toy item that he could access after dinner. So before dinner started, they would present him with a bunch of choices and he'd put down uh, what he wanted. So here's what dinner looked like during intervention. And you'll see um, this is where his schedule is, the one that I just showed him. And these uh, were choices that he'd been given and some information about the food that he was going to have to eat. I think this meal was chicken and rice and, you know, broccoli or something. He ended up really liking broccoli. As you can see, it's a lot of work for him to get that food on the fork and then to get it to his mouth. I mean, he's really working hard. And so mom learned to make those kinds of statements as opposed to just no, but saying, when you do this, then you can have what you just asked for. And another thing that mom started doing, giving him choices, she'd have a regular spoon and the adapted spoon, lay it out and say, which one do you want to use? So mom got really good at kind of embedding these little choices. And, you know, because he was then deciding what to do, he did it. So that, again, was pretty immediate. Once we moved from that one-on-one -on -one interventionist thing where he was eating a whole bunch of food, the first dinner was really quite successful. He sat down at the table. Mom asked him to eat stuff. Alicia was there kind of prompting and guiding and providing some feedback to mom. But because he'd had exposure to these kinds of foods and the expectations were clear and the motivation was there, he knew what he would get. He, you know, th this is a really bright kid. Um, you know, we pretty much laid it out. Here's the deal. Here's what's going to happen. And he was kind of like, well, why didn't you say so before? Of course, sure, I'll do that. Um, no problem. Um, I wanted to show you a clip of dinner maintenance as well, because beyond the eating, this is a really lovely example of the conversational stuff that we start, started to see happen between uh, mom and Kieran, which was really nice. So, you know, pay more attention to what they're talking about than even what he's eating. He signed six because his birthday is September 6th, and this was the end of August. 
He was going to have surgery on his tendons and figured that after his birthday he'd be able to stand. That's why the stand thing. So she's asking how old he'll be. He says six because his birthday's on the six. No. Eight. Now you are eight. Now, she only signed birthday back, so he said it again. He wants her to copy him. That's how he knows she understood. Now, there's picture, there's bug. The signs are similar. She thinks he said bug. And then I think what she didn't read in and understand is he was talking about, I want to have a birthday party and take pictures. And she was thinking, take a picture now, no, because we're eating dinner, right? So there's still some of that kind of thing going on because, you know, he uses a very few words and mom's trying to hold all the strategies in her head. But this back and forth that they're having now that they had never had before, ever, right? And that he's asking, you know, mom's birthday. Tell me about, you know, like, let's talk about that, not just about mine. So that was some of the really cool stuff that we started to see happening outside of the fact that, you know, he's eating his food. So in terms of social validity and goodness of fit data, um, overall we had really nice scores out of five, 4.9 for social validity, 4.4 for goodness of fit. Some of the interesting things, when I look at the goodness of fit for these routines, um, you know, 4.2, and it was 3.5 at the beginning and 4.8 average at the end. Um, I think what's really interesting for this first one, it was the first routine, mm -hmm. and they didn't know what was expected. And then you see for the computer routine, which was a very similar intervention, it jumped way up. And then again for dinner, which was a quite stressful and difficult routine to implement, the goodness of fit is a little bit lower at initially, but was a five at the end. So in terms of the kinds of results that we saw, um, certainly the train the trainer program was associated in improvements regarding staff knowledge. So certainly on paper, um, they were more knowledgeable in terms of functional assessment and positive behavior support. So thinking about this goodness of fit issue and how it was that we managed to achieve that and the kinds of things that we were thinking about, making sure that the PBS plans really met the goals and expectations of the parent, um, making sure that the PBS plans, again, are congruent with family lifestyle, just the way that the family kind of moves through their day, thinking about strategies and making sure that the strategies that are selected are going to be doable for the parent. And I think that this is a really important thing that we need to be thinking about when we're you know, trying to support parents who have challenging kids. These are tired parents, these are stressed parents, these are parents who have a whole lot of stuff on their plate. Um, and if we give them strategies that are really challenging, that are lengthy, that are complicated, it's not going to be a good fit because they're simply too tired and too stressed and too everything else to be able to do it. So we need to keep that in mind um, to make sure that when the parents get the plan, they're actually going to implement it because they feel it is something that they can do. And then finally, the other thing that we needed to think about was making sure that our plans were sustainable. Kinds of collateral effects that we saw, and we saw many, but these are a few of the highlights. Um, mom, in particular, talked about being able to use those same strategies in other kinds of settings and situations. Um, the other thing that started happening quite early on, once the dinner routine was taken care of, was that Kieran started eating all kinds of untrained foods, and not just at home, but out in the world. So, you know, they're out running errands. Oh, my goodness, you know, it's been forever since you've eaten. Let's pull into McDonald's. Then can I get you something that you'll eat? And they could. And I remember mom telling me the first time that she was able to actually do that. And I think they'd been on a school field trip. And, you know, they needed to stop and get something to eat. And that she could stop, give him food, and he accepted and ate it. Um, 
In terms of the interventionist and the kinds of collateral effects that she saw, one of the major things that she talked about all the time, whenever I met with her, was changes in the parent-child communication, parent-child relationship, and the mom's use of ASL. And one of the things that happens if you have a deaf child and you're a hearing parent, you go to a parent sign language class somewhere. <laughs> And there's a deaf person that teaches you stuff. You might come and they ask you, what kinds of words do you want to learn? And they teach you the signs. And, you know, you do a little coffee chat. And then you go home to your home environment and your child, and you somehow try to apply it there. And for lots of parents, it doesn't translate so well um, because they're not learning how to sign in kind of their daily context. One of the nice things about having a deaf interventionist who worked without an interpreter. She did a functional assessment with no interpreter. We sat her up with voice output software, and they did it on the computer. But then all of the rest of the meetings were done in ASL between the two of them. Um, and Alicia's quite skillful at, you know, managing communication with hearing people who have different l degrees of sign language fluency, because that's her life. But that kind of repeated exposure in the home gave mom lots more practice, and then whenever Alicia was there supporting routines, she was able to watch the communication and then go, Here, here's a better way to do this, here's a better way to sign this, here's a better way. And so she noticed that the mom's fluency really picked up quite quickly because of all of this, you know, sign language exposure in a natural setting at home. And when we think about, you know, what we know about PBS, we don't bring parents to a special room and, you know, teach them how to implement a routine and send them home and you know, tell them good luck, we go to their home. Um, and perhaps, and that's one of the things that Alicia talked about was, gee, maybe we need to be rethinking how we do sign language training for parents. Um, this is Alicia talking a little bit about some of the collateral effects that she saw. From the beginning of the study till now, I've seen a huge difference, a big improvement in lots of different ways, not just in behavior but also in the relationship between the mom and the child and a huge improvement in their communication. The mom is more able um, to express what she wants and at the same time, the son is more able to respond positively. He understands what's wanted from him, what the expectations are. Also, the use of visuals is helping a lot when we're combining it with signing. That's really improved his understanding. Um, we can show him if you do one thing, what will happen? If you don't do something, what will happen? So he has the big picture. All right, and that was one of the big things that she really recognized was that finally he knew what was going on, what the expectations were, what would happen at the end, right? As opposed to kind of living in this land where he had part of the story. Um, you know, it was much more clear for him. And when it was clear for him, he was kind of like, sure. Absolutely, I'll do whatever you like. Um, the other thing that she talked an awful lot about was that she noticed he developed deaf eyes. Um, and deaf people, their eyes, they pay a lot of attention to other people in their environment. She really noticed that his eye contact improved. He was much faster. You know, he'd notice someone come in and he would orient visually to that person because maybe you're about to say something. So those kinds of things, you know, maintaining that eye contact during conversation that he didn't do before. She noticed that he was doing more afterwards, again, because mom was more fluent and skillful, too, in, in her ability to sign stuff. It didn't take her as long to get a message out. And so, you know, he was watching because he was understanding. Just end with a quote um, from the mom at the end of the study. And she said, I learned so many strategies that are helpful, but I think the most important thing I learned is that I am the parent and I am allowed to make decisions for my child to have her say at the end that she had moved to this place where she felt she could make those decisions and kind of assert that parental role of, I know what's best for you, and I'm going to tell you what to do, and you're going to do it, and then you know I'll be able to reinforce you, and all is like happy and rosy, but that I get to be the parent, uh, I think is a really important um, statement that she made, an important thing to think about from the perspective of a parent and, and what this can give them. Thank you.